audio, I don't know. Start video. Rename him, okay. Invite, participate. Participants, okay, so there you are, you're me, for some reason, you're Jill. Okay, there you are. So you're in the group, okay? Those are under participants. So you don't need to do anything with that chat. You don't need to record, don't worry about that. If you wanna leave the meeting, this is where you go right here, okay? And okay. click that, <clears throat> that gets you out of the mute meeting. If you wanna ask a question, you raise your hand, you click there. Then he'll see your little hand go up here and they'll call Why on you. Why is this bouncing back and forth? I don't know, Ron. You do. I don't think because mute. You just did. Right up here, you unmuted it. Hmm. Okay. Muted so like everyone else. Look at yourself. You can go this way and see who else is there. Here's Greg. Can you hear? Did he hear you? Hello? Hello? Hello. Hey, Kurt. Yes, sir. Hey, Kurt. How are you, Paul? Can you see me? Yeah. Okay. I'm having trouble seeing your hair, but I see the rest of you. 
Hey, hey, come on. Here, <laughs> hey, look. <laughs> Want to put on a hat? Or? Hi, guys. Hey, Greg. Greg? I see a bunch of friends out there. We're going to be muted pretty soon, but. Yeah, a lot of familiar faces. Good to see everybody. Hey, hello, Tom. Hello, Chuck. Hello, Ed. Wow, I, see... I don't, I don't uh -huh. see any of them. Nicolette. Really? You know, I see oh. Greg Petty, Dale Peterson, and Kurt Mr. Scott. Gowers there. There should be um, a view option that you share? in the upper right corner that you can get various view options. I've got a basically a Brady Bunch view going here, but with more people. Right, 25. The top oh, right yeah. should say speaker view, and you can change it to gallery view. Oh, look who's there. Yeah, all these people. Uh, 25, so do I hit share screen? No. No? No, uh, you don't, no, uh, far upper right corner. Put your, have, put your cursor there. up there. All I have is exit full screen. Maybe I should exit the full screen. And yes, open. do that. Ah, okay. Hey, Gallery we view. Welcome, we should welcome Tim Me. Ah. Hi, Tim. Hi. Hi, guys. How are you? Good. Thanks so much for coming today. No, I, I, I greatly appreciate it. Uh, my mentor, Dan Evans, when he made the invite, I couldn't be more thrilled. Yeah, I don't see Dan here yet, but you've got the president of our chapter uh, is Paul Parker. He's somewhere if you've got the, the big screen. There he is. Hi, Tim. Paul, how are you, sir? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Good, good. Let's see, let's see how do we do that, uh, the big screen on here? There we go, we got everybody. So how many do you normally have folks participating? Typical launches are uh, mid thirties lately. Great. I've, I've been doing something uh, with my staff back in Cooperstown and uh, you know, just it's, we closed the hall on March 15th and then our, our last day was the 22nd, 23rd. Um, so I, you know, that, that isolation set in. So we kind of have a weekly Zoom call as well. And it's, uh, it's really good. So it's not a business conversation. It's a baseball conversation. And then we bring on a baseball guest. Oh, for wow. A part of it for a Q and a. So that's been enjoyable. We had Mike Trout, um, the first oh. week Hudler, Rex Hudler did it last week and gave us a virtual tour of his museum at home. And then, uh, we're going to have Jimmy Abbott on tomorrow. So nice. Uh, it's good. You know, I, the folks in Cooperstown and um, answer some of these questions when we start, but some of them are historians, librarians, you know, they're baseball fans, but some of them went to school to train to be curatorial people. So, you know, to kind of invite them into the world a little bit more, into the baseball world, if you will, of personalities is something that, uh, you know, I think it serves a purpose for all of us. Sure. Yeah. Hey, Dan Evans. Some impressive. Guests. What's up, Craig? <laughs> Glad to have you. Jimmy, thanks. Jimmy, thanks for joining us. I appreciate it. No, nah, Mr. Evans, it's it's a pleasure. I, I have a deal with my dogs that they're going to stay quiet, right, guys, for the next half hour or so. So they're in agreement. Yeah, well, uh, have your dogs talk to my dogs, please. <laughs> <laughs> well, my wife's not here right now. She's Did you been ask everybody so when you start. I I do ask everyone when we start to please mute your microphone and do not sit your screen. Okay. Hey, it's nice to see Kate Sermon here with us. We've missed you, Kate.
Paul Parker, I'm loving it. You're on. Hey, Dan. What's up, Paul? And they said it couldn't happen. Well, I, I made it. I, I was technologically successful. I'm here. <laughs> um, hey, Dan. Dan, everybody's welcome, coming through loud and clear except Nicholas. you. Yeah. yeah. Dan, you're a little dragged out. Is that right? Try that. Try it right there. Yeah, I think it's just, I, I think seriously, it's because of the amount of people on the call. Okay. So I, I just moved myself right next to the router. <laughs> it's like our intern days need, right? Yeah, exactly. Hey, I shaved for this one, Danny. Well, that <laughs> makes sense. Had to, had to do it. All right, so if I could ask everyone to mute, we have over 50 people online. It'll really help the quality of the of the session, it'll help us considerably. Wow, power. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you all. We'll wait about 30 seconds and then we'll get started. Okay, well, I'm Dan Evans, Rocky Mountain Saber Board member. And on behalf of the Rocky Mountain Saber Board, I welcome you to our April 2020 chapter meeting. We're all hoping that you're healthy and that you're getting through this as positive as you can, considering all the complications and the compromise that we're all enduring right now. Ordinarily, we'd be on Blake Street. We'd be telling Jennifer what we're looking for for our food order, talking baseball and enjoying the camaraderie that is so outstanding within our chapter. But we don't have normal anymore. So as a result, we've turned to technology to get together and we already have 56 people on this meeting. So welcome. We're gonna be talking baseball here for the next 60 to 90 minutes and we're gonna be having some fun. Today, we're thrilled to have you in our virtual house. This is a vibrant chapter, as many of you know. Those of you who are joining us on the Facebook page of Sabre, we are really proud of what we've accomplished here in the Rocky Mountain chapter. We have a worldwide audience as a result today of the Facebook page, including friends literally of mine from all over the world, and I'm really enjoying getting some of the texts so far. Thanks to Scott Bush. Thanks to Jacob Pomerank from Sabre giving us the ability to do this meeting. And I want to personally thank one of our Rocky Mountain board members, Alex Marks, for all of his help in setting this up on the administrative side. Baseball is our common bond. Whether it's history, statistics, analytics, ballparks, players, records, memorable moments, teams, strategy, it's baseball that brings us all together today. One of the great things about Sabre is we're kind of like an ice cream store. Everybody has a different reason for coming. We all walk out with a smile. Putting together this Zoom session for the last couple of weeks, I was trying to find 
an agenda that could best help us kind of get through this difficult period, make it a little bit easier. And candidly, really lucky. We got a couple of terrific people joining us. I ask you if you'd remain muted, and the reason is it just makes for a more intimate conversation while our guest speakers are talking. We'll do Q&A for both of them so you'll have your ability to talk. I encourage you to use your camera. Even Paul Parker, our president, everybody can do this. So let's get started. April 15, 1947, the 46 Dodgers had tied the St. Louis Cardinals for the first place spot in the National League. They lost a playoff in two games. It's the only team they didn't play 500 baseball against in 1946. So there was a lot of optimism in Ebbets Field on April 15, 1947. 26,623 people came to opening day. The Boston Braves and Johnny Singh was on the mound. It was a day game. A 28-year-old first baseman was making his major league debut, batting second and playing first base for the Brooklyn Dodgers. Seven Hall of Famers were there including Duke Snyder, who told me at one time that was his first day in a major league uniform. He made his major league debut the next day. But there was something different about this game, and that was Jack Roosevelt Robinson, one of my personal heroes. Rookie of the Year in 1947, MVP in 49, MVP votes in eight of his 10 years, six World Series appearances, 19 steals of home plate, a triple slash to 311, 409, and 474, which just exudes greatness. But it was much more than that. In a world where the military was still segregated, as were schools, Jack Roosevelt Robinson took the field for a major league game. It changed the game of baseball and it changed society. In 1962, when Robinson was inducted, you may not know this, there was nothing on his plaque talking about breaking the color barrier because that's what Jackie Robinson wanted. The Hall of Fame in 2008, with the permission of his incredible wife, Rachel, changed the plaque and added a line. Imagine how different our world would be if the great experiment failed, if Jackie Robinson wasn't the right person, if Branch Rickey picked the wrong person. Our society would be different, our culture would be different. The game would have been different. I encourage you all, there's a great book rich, written by Jules Teigl about Jackie and his legacy. It was called Baseball's Great Experiment. We all celebrate a little differently when it comes to Robinson, but it is Jackie Robinson Day, and I sure didn't want to go without calling out attention to one of the greatest of all Americans. A very impactful man. For me, only Babe Ruth was more impactful in the history of the game. So now let's get to the other stuff. It's year 41 in Major League Baseball for my buddy Tim Mead. His first full year as the Hall of Fame president. In 1980, he started working, I think, out of Cal Poly Pomona. <laughs> Working with great Gene Autry. As an assistant GM for a few years, for me, one of the most respected people in the game of baseball, an exceptional person at what he does, an amazing human being. I am so proud to call him my friend 
he's received so many accolades within the game, the biggest of which for me is a man that we both had immense respect for, and that's former American League Executive Vice President Bob Fischel. Now he's the president of the Hall of Fame. And Tim, I am so thankful for you joining us for today's lunch. Well, Danny, thank you very much for the opportunity. It's, uh, we go back a long, long way with a lot of stories. Um, I would tell this group, I appreciate the kind words, uh, but the person that's leading this right now, the, the passion that Danny has, that introduction right now, talking about Jackie Robinson, uh, I think Danny, you would agree that even your time with the, you know, in Major League Baseball, the only thing that separates everybody on this call and Danny and I is we're all super fans. We just got a chance to take it to a different level with our careers and our vocations. But at the end of the day, that's what we all, we both are, our fans and folks that appreciate it. I, I love the way you lay that out because uh, you know, the great experiment, I just had a, a conference call. We actually had a, a board conference call in the hall and we, we talked you know, about the uniqueness of today. Somebody was gonna cross that barrier at some point. We all know that. And, the, and I think the book expands on that, but it's the person. And then we look at it as baseball. It, it's just so far exceeds baseball and what it really did in this country and, and the awareness. And, um, you know, I was on a call today with Thomas Toll, who actually did the movie 42. And he talked about how important that was for him in that project and the relationship with the Robinson family. And, um, you know, it's to be part of that history. And that is the reason, and we'll get into this, but that, what you just explained there, Danny, is part of the reason I left the best job in the world with the Angels to go to Cooperstown is because you and I and everybody, I think everybody I know on this call shares the same passion for the game. We just were in the right place at the right time to take it to a different level. Timmy, give me a typical day um, in, the, in the life of the Hall of Fame president. You know, Danny, a lot of it's, it's different than what we went through on the club level. You know, when you would get asked that question in communication, it was like, I had a plan today and then life happened and it's whatever the, the computer or the phone brought you away. But the first thing is, is, is you get into that office where I park, I walk and I look down Main Street before I go into the hall in the offices. And I catch myself each day because you see the flagpole in the middle of Main Street you realize you're not in Orange County anymore, Toto. I mean, it's just a different place. And you walk in and, and walk into the offices and, you know, you realize, here we go. Generally, I have to go into the, the gallery to go to the other side of the library. And uh, at some point, and you go through the gallery. And every day, I never walk with my head down. I realize it's almost my own private, personal way of paying homage to realize the legacy and the history that, that is in that gallery. Um, and then you can, you know, you do what you have to do. You, you answer a lot of emails. Part of the, the challenge that I was given in assuming this position for my good friend, Jeff Idelson, was to establish relationships with the living Hall of Famers. Um, so you, you do that as frequently as, as possible. It's a little bit different because in our world, we had six weeks of spring training to meet somebody new or you, know, you would see somebody in a series of coming to your ballpark. Well, now they're retired, it's different. So I think I knew 22 of them going in and taking the job, which makes it a little bit easier. Um, so establishing those relationships has been part of it, but it's, it's doing the business of the hall. And um, you know, checking with some brilliant people that are on this, on this call, on this uh, conference as well. I'm blessed to work with a good team, a great team. And I told them when I left there, it's for me, it was going like going back to a, a college where I was a freshman on campus and every one of them staff members are associate professors because for the first time in 40 years, I know Angels baseball or felt like I did. I think I know baseball pretty well. But when you go into the Hall of Fame and you realize the depths of knowledge of the curatorial folks and the librarians and Jim Gates and, you know, Tom Shivers and, and, uh, you know, Eric Strolls and all that, you realize classes in session. So 
while my responsibilities are to lead it and work with it, the, the, my excitement is to truly to go back to class and learn what I've never learned about the game I love. That's a great answer, Timmy. You know, this morning, folks, if you didn't see it, the Hall of Fame has a series right now that is just amazing that I love to, to listen to. And they had a great session about Jackie Robinson um, with a couple of your top staff, Tim. If you could talk a little bit, because this is the Sabre, this is a research-oriented group. Some of the research opportunities and capabilities that you guys have. Well, the library is obviously, and I'm sure certainly many of you here hopefully have been to Cooperstown and had the experience of going through the library. Uh, but there really isn't a question, for the most part, that can't be asked. We don't have the periodicals or the mindset to research. And it's not just simply a, a Google search, because certainly all of you can are capable of doing that. Um, but it's the resources of video, it's the resources of film, it's the resources of audio, all the artifacts, 3Ds, um, historical comparison, photographs. I've sat in on sessions with our curatorial folks that have taken a photograph, one photograph, and given me a 15 minute explanation on the history of that photograph and all the backstories. And I'm fascinated by it. And quite honestly, Danny, for me, 15 minutes on the club level is you know, three gold bars for us in terms of time. I have a little bit more of that time in Cooperstown to learn and understand it. And, and that's the beauty of it. You have media people, you have front office folks that will reach out. Gordon Lakey, former scout who just retired after 50 years. You know, just a, a, one of the best, Danny, obviously you know. And uh, Gordon likes to come in there and just sit in the library and research projects. So I think it's fascinating. You have space all to yourself. You have a group of people that want to help you. And obviously would prefer if you had the opportunity to come in and see it in person, would prefer that because you can, you know, begets more conversation. But the willingness to help you in any project is, is phenomenal to me. So if any of our people wanted to use the digital library, use some of the research tools that you have, how would they go about doing it, Tim? I would be glad to, to put you in contact with those people. There's a lot of information on our website. I'm gonna give this out now because I did this PR person, I'll do it. My email address, if any of you ever have any questions, tmead at baseballhall.org. And if we can certainly guide or direct you to a question you have or our resources, be glad to do so. Timmy, can you talk a little bit about the Larry Walker situation? Obviously it's really close to our hearts um, going into, um, you know, November, we didn't, or January, we didn't know what the outcome was going to be. Can you walk through that a little bit from your perspective as the president of the Hall of Fame? Well, first of all, congratulations to all of you for all your efforts. Um, you know, everybody was behind spearheading the, uh, you know, the cause and the support. You're to be commended and you should, you should applaud yourselves. But for me coming in, I, I took over in June of uh, June 14th of last year. So we went right to London, all-star game, induction. You know, it was, it was a very, very busy time. And then you started looking for the at the class. And, um, you know, I heard so many great things about Larry Walker. I, I think I'd only crossed paths with him once or twice for the obvious reasons, being in the American League. Uh, but Marcel Latchman and some of my friends, people that had worked with him, uh, you know, Jay Alves and, and other folks just really talked about him. And I kind of viewed Larry from, from afar as just one of those professional players and hitters, again, not knowing him. But it was intriguing to me because so much of the focus on the, on the vote, and, you know, we can look back and certainly say it was, um, we knew what was going to happen with Derek Jeter, but nothing's official until it's official, as Mike Port would always teach us, Danny. Uh, it was a great quote to use. Uh, but you started to wonder about, you know, who was going to rise and, and Larry being on the, on the ballot for the 10th time. And he just kind of seemed as one of those folks that was, you know, you just, you just wanted to poll for. I mean, you just, 
you wanted to see it because you're reading all these great things about him. And, um, and, and that to me is what was, what was really exciting is, you know, sitting in there, okay, what's going to happen? Reading all the articles that were coming out. Again, all of you did such, such a phenomenal job. He had some very strong advocates from former media people in, uh, in Colorado and, uh, you know, the Tracy Ringlesby's and Bob Elliott's and, you know, all the debates that were being bannied back and forth about Coors Field and numbers. And then we get there and I'm sitting in the room with three other people in January when the votes were counted. And you're sitting there and after every 40 votes, we kind of give an update and we look at the percentages, just the, just the four people. And you started seeing different trends. You saw different spurts and, and the, the ballots were, you know, they, they came as they came and, and we were opened them and verified. Um, so you knew how close he was and watching that process. And then as it got down to that last quarter, it was just simply, you're, you're kind of excited for the person because you knew Derek, Derek was, Derek was going to be there. And uh, it was, I had sat in uh, before we went over and counted the ballots, I'd sat in and had a lunch and we heard Larry's call or, or uh, Larry talking about his tweet that he put out, thanking everybody in advance before he wasn't going to be elected to the Hall of Fame. And, you know, he just kind of smiled and, and kind of looked at his, it wasn't self-deprecation at all. It was, I had so much respect for the way he was handling something in advance that he had you know, he just projected out. And then once we were in that room and, and uh, you know, he made the cut with the six votes and everything, there was a lot of excitement and um, personally to watch it. Cause I mean, that's going to be my first class, you know, in totality. And uh, you know, the, the Jeter situation, and then you started to look at how, how is that going to work as a, a class together? And uh, when Jane and Jack O'Connell made the call, uh, to see his excitement, hear his excitement, and then get to meet him the next day. And to see the genuine, the genuine uh, humility and humbleness and disbelief. And that's really what it is. When he walked in the hotel, he gave Jane a big hug. Uh, and we had dinner that night and all. It was, it was really, you know, break down all the greatness, break down the game. It's still a person getting the greatest honor of his life outside of being a father and a you know husband and all the other things um and he just did uh, not to be long-winded but it was humility and humbleness that i i will always take away from larry walker fascinating what i'd like to do tim and i chatted a lot about how best to do that this and it's Tim's thought that he'd really like to incorporate as many of you into this as you can. So if you're comfortable with the Zoom platform, there's a raise hand um, issue. And when you see the raise hand, when you see the raise hand option, raise your hand. I'm able to see that. I'll open up your mic. And we get, you can ask a question. Um, it's really the best way to do this, given the amount of people that we have. Brian Werner, I'm going to open up your mic. Brian, if you could open up doors and go ahead and ask the question, Brian. Brian, I see your hand raised. Go ahead. Going once. Okay, I didn't see Brian answers. Hey, Danny, is he unmuted? And I'm going up and down. I know some of you may not be comfortable in this platform. Um, I'm not going to do that. Yeah, he's muted. He and he can't. He apparently doesn't know how to get off of it, Tim. Um, so I know somebody who has a question, and that would be. Greg Petty, so Greg, Mike, go ahead. 
we have a mute problem. So hold on one second. I'm going to go back down. I usually work off of my own platform. I'm borrowing a platform today from the national, so I don't have the same options. So Brian, if you could go ahead and open up your mic. I apologize for the technical difficulties here. We are not having any ability to open Brian's mic. If anyone has a question, you know what we can use. This is what I in my classes, Tim. We have a chat room available, and um, if within the chat room, you can just ask questions, and we can answer the questions. So if we go down to the chat room. That I'm not sure all of you are comfortable with. There's a um, there's a chat room you can ask questions. Well, I'm trying to unmute you. I can't do it so far. It's not working here. So if any of you have a question. There you go, Tim. Go ahead, Tim. Yeah, uh, I'm I'm good to go. Um, Brian, can you hear me? Or all right, I apologize, folks. I'm I'm just having a problem here hey, on Danny? the board. Hey, Brian, why don't you type me there your message? Go. Brian, why don't you type me your question? Brian, yes. Okay. What are the whole uh, Outstanding. This is from Tom. Uh, mm -hmm. What are the hall's plans for the in, in, upcoming induction ceremony? Right now, guys, we've been moving forward with our internal plans. Uh, I would tell you that that the final decision would uh, will most likely come at the end of this month. You know, we're obviously all good. We're in uncharted territory. Uh, we're going to be following the guidelines of you know, state and federal officials. We've continued our planning as any good business has had to do and needs to do. But I, I would say that we will probably in, be in the position of making a final decision uh, at the end of the month, uh, 1st of April. Um, it, as far as a contingency plan, this is from Chris Meyer. Chris Moyer, I'm sorry, Chris. Uh, Contingency plan, we've discussed a, a lot of options. Uh, certainly as, as you know, every, every business has been doing. Um, but I think that the, the Hall of Fame, you know, obviously we would love to go through with it on July 26, but ultimately this induction is special. It's special to the baseball community. It's special across the country. And uh, it has to be done right. There is a, there's a great expectation, you know, not only for the class, of, of inductees because it's their moment, but it's also a gathering of all the living Hall of Famers who are able to participate. It's also something special for the village of Cooperstown and for all the people that come up there. So we need to make sure that those standards are adhered to and in, in no way, shape or form would we we'd look to put or host anything that would shy away from uh, that quality. Uh, let's see, go down. To Youth. Oh, this is from Tom. Tom Cr. Tom. Uh, do you think without the virus, this summer's attendance would break 07? You know, we projected it. Uh, we really thought. Uh, I think with with Derek Jeter, obviously the Rocky fans that will be there, uh, the the Canadians that will venture from up north. Uh, I think we were we are expecting to rival uh, that attendance. Uh, you know, obviously last year with Mariano going in, there was a lot of projection for big crowd, and we had fifty three thousand. We had some tough weather before that, and uh, you know, I think there's a lot of excitement, and this has been an induction that's been anticipated for a long time. It's going to be a great class, and while we focus on Larry and Derek. 
you know, Ted Simmons is obviously in there and Marvin Miller as well. It's, it's a great class. So, uh, you know, we expect a great, we expect a great crowd. We really do. Um, besides the induction, what is your favorite annual event the hall does and what events do you, this is from Christopher Cohen, and what events do you envision adding to the hall's calendar? That's a great question because I have not been there a full 12 months. Uh, I haven't seen the whole cycle. Now we unfortunately have had to cancel Classic Weekend, which is held over Memorial Day. And as you know, uh, a representative from each of the 30 clubs uh, and alumni comes and plays in a game. Uh, then there's a night at the hall that folks can, you know, dine uh, with the Hall of Famers, take photos and autographs. But from what I know from players that we've sent there, it's a great time for players to get back in uniform. You know, baseball really doesn't have old timers day games anymore. So this is a wonderful opportunity. Um, you know, the events induction weekend was something, you know, I was at Nolan Ryan's. I was at Vladimir Guerrero's, but to be part of it and sit on stage and be surrounded by those guys and realize how many of them are responsible for me loving the game today, that was exciting. Um, but I love the whole, you know, the, the whole feeling of Cooperstown for the better part of three months. You know, I, I'd love to say it's one event, but it's, it's the feeling. I mean, to go to Cooperstown, you love baseball. I mean, it's just pretty much it's very straightforward. But I do want to say an event. Um, I was a little homesick when I got out to Cooperstown uh, for obvious reasons after 40 years and leaving everybody back in Orange County. Uh, I missed a lot of the community relations events that I was involved with and will continue to be involved with. But Lee Smith and his wife came back a couple weeks after induction weekend and there's a place called Pathfinder Village, about 20, 25 minutes outside of Cooperstown. It's a, it's a community, about 300 acres, I believe, for Down syndrome folks, not kids, but across the spectrum. So every year, it's been part of the Hall's relationship with uh, Pathfinder to take a Hall of Famer out there, give him a tour, and let him interact with the residents. It's a phenomenal institution, guys. An in, in institution, I should say, entity. No walls. It's it's not institutionalization. It's a community. So the uh, the gentleman who runs the the the, uh, the program gave us a great tour. Uh, we went through. We saw they have a bakery. They have a garden. They have all these a lot of self sufficiency. And then we went into the gym, and there were people from. 15 or 16, 40s to a, uh, I think he was 49 year old who'd had a heart attack the previous year, all Down syndrome, and we played kickball. And I got to tell you, it's probably one of the biggest smiles I had after leaving and arriving in Orange County or uh, arriving in Cooperstown. Lee Smith pitching, his bride playing a little uh, right side infield, and me playing outfield in in, uh, in a gym playing kickball, which I had not done in. A long, long time. That's an event now I'm going to look forward to. Uh, what's your favorite? Have you confirmed if Marvin? Uh, this is from Tom. Tom again. Have you confirmed if Marvin M Miller's family will be in attendance? Um, right now, no, not at this point. Uh, you know, I think a lot of the things you've read along the way, we've had contact with. Uh, his daughter Susan and his son Peter, and uh, right from the get-go, and uh, congratulations, and, and we've had communication since. Uh, but I think as, as things presently stand, uh, they're going to honor their their father's wishes, and uh, you know he he will be represented by others, and we'll see how things change periodically uh, or moving forward. Um, but Marvin Miller will be honored very much in the same manner that uh, the other three members of his class will as well. Um, let's see. Uh, this is from, I'm sorry, MSR, but 
Were there any specific trends or other indications as to how this happened regarding Larry making up the, the ground? He did. No. <laughs> I think the question for, you know, the question we could never answer ultimately would be the question to ask members of the BBWAA who went through the voting process and how things change. Um, you know, the beauty of this process, folks, is, is really the individuality. You know, we, there's certainly some discussion on social media, but we don't get to know what the 370 folks who voted this past year were thinking. We don't canvass them other, outside of the vote. We tabulate the vote. I could tell you that vote is done with the highest integrity. I'd heard about it before I joined the hall. Now that I've gone through it, I've witnessed it firsthand. Um, so to answer that question about what the writers were thinking, I, I really couldn't tell you. I, I couldn't tell you the thought process of the one individual who didn't vote for Derek. Um, you know, how do things change? Burt Blylevin was, uh, you know, elected in his, what, his 14th season. I'm not sure what changed over the course of those 14 years. Uh, and that's what, that's what makes this a great discussion and debate, because you can talk about Hall of Fame, potential Hall of Famers, people that should, people feel that should be in the Hall of Fame. You talk about it for 12 months. And I know baseball oozes through my blood, but I don't hear those discussions as much relative to the other sports. And um, I think that's what makes us, you know, to Danny's point earlier about all the things we love about the game. To me, this is one of the exciting aspects of it. So, uh, you know, I've seen some of the national writers. I don't remember anybody's vote nor would I ever have a discussion with them about their vote or why now. So when I go to social media the day after and I see the debates and the exchanges amongst the voters, it's interesting for me and I'm gonna learn perspective at the same time you're gonna learn perspective. That's, that's kind of exciting where we get to be a fan. Um, let's see. Brian, okay. uh, explain to the new- Kim, thank you. Yep. Thank you for doing it the way you're doing it. We're fixing it from our side, so thank you. Yeah, no, no problem. Um, give, can you explain the new era committees and how they will work to nominate the players? Uh, obviously, there's been periodic changes. Uh, I, I know Jeff and uh, Brad Horn were charged with the, with the board to review you know, the, the committee process. And I would tell you, you know, and Danny knows this as well as anybody, if Danny had a team with 89 wins in August, he still worked his hardest in September to fine tune that team to be the best it could when he went into October. And I think that that's the same, uh, every general manager did it. I think that's our same challenge in the hall. I'm not gonna sit here today, folks, nine months in and be an expert on it. I'm. I'm the freshman still learning, uh, but we have been charged to look at the process and see if it can ever be fine-tuned. I know Jeff spent a lot of time on it. John Shestakovsky, who's on it as well. Obviously, you've had the, the periods of time. You know, there were the years that the, just the Hall of Famers voted. Um, you know, the, the Golden Era Committee, you know, it's 10 years enough, it's five years, the rotation, the right time. Modern era, today's game, uh, all those things will constantly be analyzed and scrutinized. I would tell you when all is said and done, probably the focus, focal point, and, and it's not marching orders, but I think the thing is held true, is there's 19,960 19, players have worn a major league uniform. You know, less than 1% of them are gonna be, get inducted into the Hall of Fame. And I think that's, you know, I, I would tell you, and Brian, this is kind of a long-winded answer to your question. There has been no discussion that I've been part of or heard or heard that has happened about ever tweaking the system to benefit or disadvantage anybody. And I think that speaks to the integrity. It speaks to the integrity of the process. And I do want to share one thing that I did not know at this time. The 16 people, we select the electorate after the board approves the candidates that could be on that electorate. We go through a process where you try to make sure there's uh, 
you know, no outstanding, obvious conflicts. And you work real hard on that because you just don't want to hear afterwards, you know, the, the inevitable stories. Well, I, we, we had the board approval and I called the 16 folks and extended the invitation to them to participate on, on the electorate last December. A couple couldn't for conflicts, family conflicts, but really wanted to do it, okay? The next group, so 16 of the 18 were automatic. One of those individuals was David Glass, okay? I did not know David Glass was not healthy when I extended that invitation. I, I had no idea, I mean, to the severity of it. David Glass accepted that opportunity to be served on that committee came to San Diego, sat through the, you know, our two days, the process, and, uh, and obviously passed this past January. But even with his health, even with the knowledge that he was sick and ailing, it meant so much to him to be part of the Veterans Committee. That is the integrity of, of the people and of the process itself. For however long I serve in Cooperstown, that will be a story that probably will always be at the forefront of my mind because, you know, when Danny, you talk about how much the game means to you, you know, the, everybody on this call, we're at what, 75 right now. It means, it means something that's, that's really basically very hard to describe. David Glass was just a physical example of that to me. Uh, given the whole, this is from Mike and, and Brian, I hope I answered that a little bit. Um, the committee, one final thing, the committees don't select the 10 candidates. The HOC committee does. That's a historical overview committee which comes to Cooperstown every two years in January and looks at candidates and numbers and research in the various committee categories. They then get together and submit the list to the Hall of Fame for the, those 10, uh, 10 members. Obviously we have two committees forthcoming this December. So we have no say so in who those 10 candidates are. And those are noted historians. You can have Steve Hurt, um, John Thorne, uh, the Ken Rosenthal's, people that have been in this game and have left their mark in this game. They come up with those candidates, not Cooperstown. I, and I hope I'm not stepping on toes, but I kind of describe our roles as Switzerland. We enforce, we're just, we're neutral. We don't, we, we work with the BBWA on the process when adjustments need to be made. But as far as the names, uh, we don't try to promote or direct anybody in any given direction. And when you sit in that room for the Veterans Committee in particular, it is pointed out, emphasized, re-emphasized that this is not a room to try to garner votes or support for somebody other than your individual feeling. Um, constructive criticism, analyzation of a player's career. That's all, that's, that's where it stops and starts. Uh, given, this is Mike, given the hullabaloo around Jeter's election not being unanimous, what are the chances that the hall will release each voter's ballots by name? Again, on that one, Mike, we don't conduct that vote. That's all done by the BBWAA. Uh, Jack O'Connell, and uh, obviously we use an agency uh, in helping with the process. We, we, those votes, we do receive the package, are put in a safe at the hall, probably never to be reviewed again, uh, but they're there for our archival purposes. Uh, that decision will ultimately be made, uh, you know, I know I was asked this question and was kind of caught flat-footed, quite honestly, at, at uh, at the, the media gathering the next day, there was a request made by the BBWAA uh, to make their votes public. And that is a board decision to uh, approve that or not. At the time of that discussion, I believe there were 89 or 90 uh, voters that had voted. It was, I think it was an 80 to nine vote that they wanted in public. Um, and at that time, I think the electorate was over 500. So 
was it representative in totality? Perhaps not. I'm still learning the history of that discussion. I would tell you, I think with the new age of, so, new age of social media, there's, there's obviously with a tracker, there's a, a desire for that to be public. Uh, I hear everything from you know the political standpoint. If you're gonna if you're gonna have a vote, you have to stand by your decision and be able to talk about it publicly. Uh, you know, I see both sides of the story or both sides of the uh, the opinions on it. But you know, it, it's also there are there are folks who have expressed to me that they don't want their their vote public, and for for the very reason for the the one gentleman you know gentleman lady whomever. Uh, one voter uh, voted not to uh, support Derek Jeter's you know, election this year, the firestorm that transpires afterwards. So, you know, I'm not trying to dance around it. I see both sides. Um, I've been someone who's been very opinionated in terms of if, if, I, have an, if I have an opinion or if I have a, a thought, I will, I will throw it out there and I will back it up or learn a different perspective if need be. But I think ultimately it's still a, a BBWA discussion. I think that they will approach the hall again at some point and it will be open for discussion um, within the board of directors. So, uh, let's see. Kim, Kim I fi I, we fixed our, our thing. So I wanna call on Brian, whose mic is now open. Yeah. He was our initial questioner. Brian, go ahead. I'll be the guinea pig to see if this works. Actually, um, Tim, Brian. thank you. You've got, you've got through the question. I just had some questions on how that those era committees are out there now to basically look at players further than 15 years ago, and they're going to meet every couple of years, and, and, and they will come up with a, a list of, of names to, to be submitted. Absolutely, and there's a rotation. And if you get back to, you know, the hall tried to catch up a little bit, and – you know, with the Negro League players, and and, uh, and I don't have the year at the top of my head, but one of the things that comes open, look at where you are now, and in, in your discussion points with Saber, and I don't know who the longest active member is in this group, but war wasn't discussed 15 years ago. Okay, so there's different there's different measurements now being used to look at players' careers, and you know I think they're very valid. So. As the hall goes on, somebody that, that was open uh, or out there does have a chance. You don't want to close the doors completely. You want to leave yourself open to new information. I would say with folks such as yourselves, historians, writers, super fans that just love the research, the game that aren't part of a group, um, I don't know that many things haven't been uncovered in the game. But again, there's 19,960 players that have worn the uniform, or 1,940 players have worn the uniform. And if somebody could come up with a new system, I think you have to be open to listening and an evaluation. I mean, when, when I grew up, you know, I, I, I come from Mike Trout and Albert Pujols. So I would say that nobody's going to have to do a lot of research um, when their time comes five years after their career. But you used to say, that's a Hall of Famer. Okay. And I think now there's just different ways of, of measurements and we all have to be open to it. I'm 61 years old. I'm not closed minded as a fan or as a president of the hall of fame in my role. And I, I think that, uh, I think Danny, when you think about when you were a general manager, how you evaluated players, if you step back in that role today, some of the measurements and the analytics that you would not have conceived doing it in your time. No doubt. No doubt. I think the electorate has changed just like the game has changed, Tim. Very much so. And, and we all have to be open to it. Look, I, you know, when you talk about the game and changing, I hope that the game returns in 2020, aside from what we're all going through for so many different reasons. Because you know what? Again, let's just take the health. Let's just uh, hypothetically, you're going to see some twists and turns in it that we probably would not have imagined. And now it's going to be an interesting time to experiments the right word and, and see what uh, see what might work and what we might be open to. I mean, I remember saying there is no way that you want to have interleague play. You know, the World Series is pure. Just don't hear that conversation anymore. I, I mean, it, it's just 
so many of the things have changed. Um, I, I think what I was upset or what I let bother me about a year ago that I haven't had a thought about in 11 months since. And I think that's, that's the way the game, the beauty of the game, it's the beauty of life. We just evolve. Jim, uh, I, I can't say enough thank yous. Let's take one more question and then we're going to move to the second part of our, of our afternoon. But thank you so much. If you do one more question and then we'll, uh, we'll wrap up your segment. Sure. And, and guys, I would tell you, use that email address. I may be a little bit slow with everything else I have going on, but I know that there were some other questions and, and if I could answer them, uh, interact with you, I'd be glad to. Timmy, I know there was one question. It's amazing what I experienced here for the last half hour, but there was one question about when is the best time to visit the hall? Other than the three days we're close. Um, <laughs> you know, honestly, October is wonderful. I know we're all watching postseason, but September, October, it's, it's wonderful if you're up there and you can see the change of seasons because it's, Spend as much time as you want to in, hall, in the hall. You're not going to run into the crowd, certainly. But to go down to the hotel and eat out in the, you know, in the, uh, the balcony with the rocking chairs where the Hall of Famers sit and look out at the lake and imagine that lobby being full of Hall of Famers walking around and congratulating each other and seeing each other like it's a fraternity that gets together once a, a, once a year. It's a special time. Uh, I think you can enjoy the Americana of Cooperstown. Um, you know, I, I was looking forward to the change of seasons. I, I really was, and that, that was important to me. Um, there's one question that came up from EDG. What surprised me about the job following Jeff? Is there anything I would like to do differently while respecting traditions? Uh, I want to learn from Jeff. He gave me a baton, and it's kind of like a, a NASCAR road race. Just keep turn, making left-hand circles and going as fast and as far as you can, as long as you can. Um, but there are some things that I think we as an institution, I'd like to see us try to bridge the gap a little bit more with today's players and the Hall of Famers and the history of the game. And I think, I think a lot of times guys get a bad rap. There's a lot of these players that know, many of the players that know the history of the game. And as you mature, you know, you want to know more. I don't think it's right to put all that on a 22 or 23 year old, you know, that he doesn't care or he's not as interested in. Go ask him that question when he's 32 or 33 and been around great players and they visited. One of the things we started in spring training and gotten through most of the Cactus League, uh, we've obviously had to shut it down, is we're sending a lifetime pass to every major league player with one day of major league service. Now, I could have been a non-roster player that showed up in camp. So I, I'm, I think we may have gotten six or eight of them out, and we're going to hand deliver some more. Uh, but the thought process is, it says Mike Trout, lifetime member. There's a quote from Hank Aaron on the back. There's the, a, the photo in the plaque gallery with Jackie Robinson and a couple other plaques. And the purpose of that, and we individualized the letter to him as well. It's the introduction of the Hall of Fame. If the player showed up there at any time in his life, he's gonna get in free anyway. So it's not the lifetime membership, but it's our calling card. It's also a reminder that we're gonna knock on your door because at some point in your career, whether it's a cup of coffee career or a 15 year Hall of Fame career, you're gonna do something that's gonna be remembered historically. And Cooperstown would like to knock on that door and ask you to preserve that artifact or something from that special moment or game to, to, to be preserved alongside artifacts from Babe Ruth and Ty Cobb and Mays and Aaron and everybody else. And um, we, we received some pretty good feedback initially and uh, we hope to grow that program moving forward. And then last, last answer, Danny, is we'd like to externalize the hall a little bit more. Not everybody can get to Cooperstown. But the technology like we're using here today, it's only going to grow and it's only going to improve. And we have to stay on top of ways of bringing Cooperstown to middle America, to Seattle, Washington, Orange County, whatever. That's going to be part of our charge as well. Outstanding. So. Timmy, 
I can't thank you enough. An absolutely fantastic session. Thank you for answering everybody's question while I was uh, trying to fix everything. Um, I can't say enough. Thank you. And, and for everybody, you need to know, Timmy being a Southern Californian, if you follow him on Instagram, there are some hysterical photos of him shoveling and handling the winter in Cooperstown, which you talk about his greatest challenge. I think Timmy's greatest challenge was the weather. I have three parkas. I haven't had a park in 50 years. So it's, uh, I have three versions for the teens, the zeros and 30 plus. So it's, it's been a pleasure. I don't want to hold up your next guest. Um, guys, thank you very much. And um, please, please reach out if, if I can answer any questions. Take care. Ken, thank you. Thanks, Tom. I appreciate you coming on this. If you're free to stay with us as we go into the uh, into the next segment. So thank you, Jimmy. All right, we're going to take a moment here. I want to say one thing prior to going in, and everything's fixed now. So we're going to thank you to Jacob Pomeranke. He and I were working behind the scenes to get this fixed. Um, all of the chapters events on the calendar are right now in a state of flux, just like everything else with our life, including our waistlines. So any of the events that we would normally have, just hang with us, go to the Facebook page, go to the website, follow us on Twitter. If there's any announcements, it'll come in email form. Um, I wish we had more definitive stuff, but we just don't right now, and that's just where it is. So now we're gonna come to the second half of our session, and I'm thrilled. Um, Mark Anderson is the founder of at Major League Baseball or MLB Cathedrals, a really great, great Twitter feed. He started on Twitter September of 2013. I remember the day I was in an airport, kind of hard to believe. Now he's a top 50 follow from anybody who follows and evaluates Twitter feeds. Mark gets unbelievable accolades. He's got almost 88,000 follows followers on Twitter. I thought I was doing well, Mark. You're kicking my butt. Um, former, he's a Sabre member. He's looking to affiliate with a new Sabre group because he's a little too far away, living in Savannah, Georgia. Mark Anderson, welcome, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Hey, Dan, thank you. How's the audio? Thank you. Audio, hey, Mark, we're happening. So everybody, we're going to jump in in a, in a heartbeat here. Um, but Mark, I'd love you to just talk about why you started this on Twitter and just overall your thought process about the, uh, the whole thing you're doing right now. Sure. Hey, thanks, Dan. Um, first, I want to thank you and Paul for having me. Um, thank you, Tim, for being here. That was a wonderful experience, and I'm honored to be on the same stage as you. Um, I'm, I'm happy to be here on Jackie Robinson Day. That means a lot. Um, thank you all for being here. And to answer your question, I'm not any too much different than all of you. I've always been a big, passionate fan about baseball. Um, my particular niche and love is in the history of the game, and I, I've always loved architecture, and ballparks fit right into that. So I've done a, a extensive amount of research on on, on baseball history and, and ballpark history in, in particular, and um, one day I just decided to share some of what I learned on social media, and I thought I'd find maybe 500 other people that would enjoy what I've learned over uh, uh, during the process, and it turned out to be a lot more than that, including all the, uh, some of you fine folks. So um, that's what really got me started. Um, at the time when I was when I started, I was in, I was actually in the military, I was in the army, and I was stationed over in Korea. Um, I couldn't bring my family at the time, and, and so I had a lot of things time on my hands, and and. and, 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 and 
Awesome. All right, we're going to jump right in. Mark and I have cheated a little bit. We've gone through this. Um, I'm one of his biggest fans. We've gone through. We're going to have to use a little different formats. It won't be uh, the way it would be if we were in an office environment. But Mark, here we go. You ready? Yes. All right. Drive, and we're going to jump right. Had to do a little different speed than I ordinarily would have, but here we go. All right. The drive should come up in a moment here, and we'll be sharing screens, and we're going to go right into. I had to close all my windows to get some things done. So that's the reason we're a little slow here. Mark, as you and I worked on this last night, we know we're good. So, right. All right, so one moment and we will get started. Again, I apologize, but this is live Zoom and this is what happens sometimes. Exactly. <laughs> All right, so here we go. All right, Mr. Anderson, are you ready? And the floor is, <laughs> yeah. hold on one second, here we go. And again, this is ordinarily not the way we would do it. I close all my windows to get everything repaired. So this is, this is what we go to. Mark, you're up, go uh, ahead. Yeah, perfect. So um, we have half an hour, 25 minutes to half an hour. So I'm going to, and a lot to cover. So I'm going to run through this really quickly. So I apologize in advance for talking really fast. Um, I thought I would just share some interesting facts. You know, um, again, I, my, my particular niche is uh, ballparks. And, and let's, let's begin with, this is, this right here is a, a water coloring by a guy named Jeff Salta. Um, it's, it's union grounds in, in, Brooklyn and, and the reason this this little field here is significant is because in 1869 this was the first ballpark that was fenced in which allowed the owner William um, Kemmeyer to to charge admission at the time it was 10 cents which translates only to about a dollar and 95 two dollars today which is still pretty inexpensive but uh, next slide is that a luxury suite in center field Margie? It was just a gondola. Um, the 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 venue actually doubled as the ice skating during the winter. Amazing. Okay. Just hang with me, folks. This is we're going to do. This yeah, while you're doing fashion. over time, there's been an amazing amount of different things that have actually been in play. Um, you know, speaking of that gondola, you know, as as the monuments in center field at Old Yankee Stadium, Force Field, they kept their batting cage in the center. Um, the the light towers were in play. Of course, Tiger Stadium had the flagpole um, right here. Okay, so this is a this is a picture of the Baker Bowl in Philadelphia. It was home of the Phillies from the 1800s all the way to 1938. The reason this picture is significant is if you look at the support columns on the right, it's the first ballpark that actually extended out oh, beyond the support columns or cantile um, cantilevering or cantilevered. Um, so next photo. Okay, this is, this is a picture of the, the 1908 World Championship champion uh, Cubs at Westside Park. And the reason I pulled this picture up is kind of to show you before the Baker Bowl, if you look at the support columns and you look at the upper deck, they sat flush with the field. So um, the Baker Bowl was a significant step forward in ballpark development. Next slide. I don't know about that mask out, Mark. I'm right. not sure. Okay, this is South End's ground in Boston. This is uh, home of the Boston Braves, actually the Bean Eaters at the time. Um, as you can tell, ballpark's uh, evolution is, you know, different style choices. Uh, I like this medieval style with the turrets on there. Next slide. Okay, 
And this right here is the Palace of the, Pan the Fans in Cincinnati. It was the home of the Reds from 1902 to when Crosley, Redland Field or Crosley Field opened in 1912. Um, it was made of all wood. Um, each one of those columns was hand carved. Um, what made this significant is if you look underneath and you see the right in front, the kind of round um, uh, boxes there, those were the first luxury suites in baseball. And Next slide. And they had parking at that ballpark too. Yeah. Oh yeah, the underneath was actually the first um, stadium to have underground parking. Now it was a little different. Um, your the the fuel that your vehicle uh, took in was more in the form of oats. It, it was had horse stables. So okay, so this is a picture I took. I, I um, when I was up in Detroit, I uh, snuck into the Packard plant up there. The reason this building is significant is one of the first that was made of um, concrete or steel reinforced concrete. It's still, it's been abandoned since 1958, but it's still structurally sound today. And this is significant in that um, ballparks starting in 1909. Okay, so this is it. right here's a photo of the polo grounds in 19. Or excuse me, 1910. Um, obviously, it's uh, it's it's in bad condition after a, a massive fire. This was not uncommon for your early ballparks. Um, next slide. I think we're here, right? Okay, so this is going to be a picture of Shy Park in Philadelphia, home of the athletics from 1909 to 1970 under construction and is the first con uh, steel reinforced concrete ballpark. That same year, next slide. Okay, that's that's uh, Shy Park after it was open in 1909. And who again played there? Th that Kevin? was the, that was the home of the Philadelphia Athletics. It was the first concrete and steel uh, ballpark, and that was actually the day that was the day it opened in 1909. Okay, and this is Forbes Field. It also opened in 1909. This was in Pittsburgh. It was up in the Oakland area of University of Pittsburgh area. If you've ever been up in that direction. Um, it also opened in 1909. It was home of the, the Pittsburgh Pirates up until 1970. Wow, so that ballpark lasted that long? Correct. Both Forbes and uh, Shy Park, which was re later renamed Connie Mack went uh, last 1909 and 1970. Amazing. Here, um, Many of you are familiar with pictures of Ebbets Field, what it looked like when Jackie played there with the big, huge, massive uh, grandstands out in center field. Um, this is actually what it looked like in 1913 when it opened. Um, and if you notice that the grandstands extend just barely beyond first and third base, um, that was pretty much most of your ballparks that opened between 1909 and 1923 looked like. In fact, that was the big boom during baseball's, um, the first building boom. Every single team in baseball got a new stadium um, or rebuilt in with steel and concrete between 1909 and 1923, except for the Phillies, which had the Baker Bowl, which we showed you earlier. Now the Browns and Cardinals did share stadiums. Next slide. Again, showing you how the grandstands um, originally began just barely past the first base and third base lines. This is Navin Field in 1912. Um, this was, it was later named um, Tiger Stadium and um, was used until 1999 by the Detroit Tigers. OK, 
Okay, this is, this is uh, Redland Field in Cincinnati. Um, it also opened in 1912. Um, it was re later renamed Cosley Field and, and another picture of just how far the grandstands went down the third baseline. Next slide. One of the coolest parts of that ballpark, my dad took me there when I was a kid, was there was a berm in the outfield that led to the wall. There was no warning track. So you would go up the, um, the incline to the fence. And as a young boy, I was like seven or eight years old. It was an amazing place to see in the outfield. Duff, uh, a few stadiums had that. Uh, Fenway Park, Duffy's Cliff, 1912, I want to say 1933, had a 10 foot incline as well. Um, so there is President what Minnie Maid Park had before they tore it out last year. Okay, so the, the, we've already shown you this one. This is back to Ebbets again. Next slide, 1913. You gotta get a new assistant, your mark. I'm just telling No worries. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so this is Fenway Park. Um, this is the day it opened in 1912. Also that same exact week, Tiger Stadium or Naven Field opened on, on the same day. And um, that same week, was just to put in perspective how old Fenway Park is, the Titanic sank that same week. Amazing. Let's see, we're... 15, so we're on 16. Sorry, Mark. I'm just no worries. And they don't. Parker, Parker's budget isn't enough for me to be a lead at this one. Go ahead. So here's a picture of what was known as Wiggum Park. Um, you would probably know it better as Wrigley Field. This was taken in 1916, the first year the Cubs used it. Notice it's only one deck. Um, the actually the ballpark was not built for the Cubs it was actually built for the Chicago Whales of the Federal League and when that uh, when that league disbanded the Cubs took over and it's um, been history ever since and Mark a couple of my fellow board members Greg May and Greg Petty and I are all growing up Cub fans and we recognize this shot looking westward from the train platform at the Addison train stop. That's that's literally where this is. It's just an amazing shot. You're, I don't know what you just did, Dan, but the audio is so much better. Yeah. All right, next slide. Okay, this is a um, shot from in Chicago in 1933. Um, this is actually during taken during the first All-Star game. Um, if you notice now the grandstands have extended all the way around to the outfield. Um, and the reason for this was the during the 1920s, you know, the, with the livelier ball and a, a, a gentleman named Babe Ruth, uh, the popularity of uh, baseball grew exponentially. And so this is kind of just an illustration of how ballparks went from this one, like Comiskey, like I showed you in Ebbets earlier, it originally started out just going, the grandstand just going beyond first and third base. Next slide. That's a remarkable shot. Here, if you remember earlier, the 1913 shot of Ebbets Field where the, the grandstands were just beyond the first and third baseline, this is what it looked like when it was expanded. This is actually taken, it was expanded in the 20s, but this shot, aerial shots from 1933 as well. Next slide. Okay, this, this is a, a new era for baseball, the 1950s. You know, people came back from the war. Um, it was a booming time in America. The automobile became more present. And, and one of the reasons most teams wanted new ballparks is because of lack of parking. 
Um, Walter O'Malley got his wish when he moved the team to Los Angeles and built Dodger Stadium. This is a picture from the first game there. Um, and you notice the parking lot is pretty, pretty present in this photo. Next, next slide. The amazing thing about that day is the water fountains weren't operative. Imagine that, 56,000 people, no water. Okay, this is an aerial of Candlestick Park when it opened in 1960s. Also just to illustrate how valuable air parking was at that time. Coldest ballpark I have ever been to and it's not close. Right. And that was before the it was filled in for the 49ers. It wasn't closed, I want to say 1971, 72. All right. All right. Okay, um, the reason I'm showing this picture, and this is a different one, this is actually a DC stadium, which is now known as RFK Stadium in Washington, DC. This opened in 1961 for the new Washington Senators team after the original Washington Senators team moved to Minnesota and became the Twins. The reason this is a significant ballpark is it was the first one that, you know, I would consider a cookie cutter ballpark. It was where the grandstands would slide depending on the football or baseball configuration. Most people think of, you know, Atlanta Fulton County Stadium, Bush Stadium, Riverfront, and Veterans as your cookie cutters, but this was actually the first one. Next slide. That's a great shot, Mark. A new era in baseball stadiums and ballparks began in 1965 when the Astrodome opened. This is right four was finished. If you look in the left hand corner barely you can see where Colt Stadium was, um, where the the Astros were born as the Colt 45s. Um, next slide. Okay, this is inside the Astrodome that year 1965 originally opened as a grass field. Um, the, the plan was for it, the light to come through properly and, and grow grass in there. Um, in that process, it was nearly impossible for outfielders to track fly balls. So they tinted the windows in, and killing the grass. So by the end of 1965, if you saw green on the field, it was because they used paint. Um, and AstroTurf actually came out of necessity. And by the 80s, um, half, 12 of the 26 ballparks had artificial turf. Next slide. And Mark, to the right of the golf sign on the right, you see upstairs that balcony with the brown um, facing. Talk a little bit about what they had out there. The owner of the Astros had a nice little gig out in right center field. Yeah, the president, the general, the presidential suite, he, had, he actually lived in there for a time and had his own um, a house, including, and I can't really tell from this picture, but there was a window that looked directly out onto the field where he had a nice little game room with a pool table and everything in it. Judge Hoffines, and he used to raise the stakes yeah. for billions whenever his, when his team was losing, it was a real situation with hey Dan your audio is live live zoom folks that's what we're just yeah it'll it'll be back in a second mark I'm just going okay, through getting the get screen back up. Okay. Here we go. Just hang with me. Just need this to come in. I'm with you again, Mark. Here we go. OK, 
Okay, for time purposes, we're going to 1992. This is Oriole Park at Camden Yards. Um, up until then, you know, this, it and officially ended the cookie cutter era. Next slide. What I love about this, this rendering right here is what HOK actually presented the Orioles for what became Oriole Park at Camden Yards. If you know, if you, you can't really see the inside of it, but if you did, it would look exactly like uh, Comiskey Park 2 or what is now known as Guaranteed Rate Field on the inside. Um, it was Janet Marie Smith's credit that she used actually had the foresight to keep the warehouse um, bring back the green seats, bring back the, the clock, the wrought iron, the detail on the, the seat caps and, and so on and so forth. Once, once Oriole Park at Camden Yards was built, every, every owner in baseball wanted one. Next slide. Okay, so this was just kind of a fun little rendering. This was presented to the White Sox before they built Guaranteed rate field. Um, this is Armor Field that would have sat just north of Comiskey Park and faced towards downtown. Next slide. And it would have been the first uh, ret what we call now retro ballparks, but uh, the owner uh, of the White Sox passed on it. And this is just another plot at the area view of the same ballpark. Next slide. You're doing and great work. Your operator is just the only thing, thing keeping you back, right? Oh, yeah. good. And here's a, a digital recreation of the same ballpark. Next slide. slide. So, in the few minutes that we have left, I thought I'd have some fun and I'd show you some, some concepts that never really uh, came to fruition. This was actually the Truman Sports Complex. Um, notice the, that's Arrowhead on the left with Kauffman Stadium on the right. It would have been the first retractable with stadium. Next slide. And that, that roof would have covered both. In other words, it would have gone back and forth between the two different stadiums. This is actually the stadium that Walter O'Malley proposed for the Brooklyn Dodgers before they took off to Los Angeles. Um, Robert Moses didn't want to give them the land and wanted them to go out in Flatbush and the rest is history. The Mets are not out in Flatbush. Or excuse me, flushing and never got built, but it would have been the first dome state. And this is a fun one. Um, this is actually a proposal for Three Rivers Stadium over the Allegheny River in Pittsburgh. Next slide. Okay, uh, the Yankee Stadium with a retractable roof. Next slide. Or the new Yankee Stadium with a retractable roof. And then the next slide is City Field with a retractable roof, I believe. It is? Yeah. Okay, next slide. Okay, so I'm gonna leave this for people in the audience. Is there a way they can communicate? Who wants to take a guess of what this concept was? Well, we can't do it under the current screen share, but we will do it when we're done screen sharing. Okay, so, well, I'm gonna give it away with the next slide. So let's not do this, but this is actually a, a, a concept for Bears Stadium, which eventually became I saw that. See, no, I 
it's too late now. But it was Bear Stadium, which meant they came a mile high. Next. And this is this is mile high being extend, uh, extended or in 1967 and 1968. Next. Or it's still Bear Stadium at that point. Here's an aerial of Mile High Stadium when the Rockies played there from the 1993 to 94 season. Um, a fun fact, you remember what we, we talked about yesterday, Dan, on what ballpark is the, how, the oldest in the National League? Yes. You want to tell, tell the people in the audience what you think? Well, 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 the oldest ballpark in the National League is Wrigley Field. Correct. Because Second's Dodger Stadium. Correct. And number three? Yes. Well, I know what number three is, but only because I know you. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, Coors Field is now the third oldest uh, ballpark in the National League. This is obviously not Coors Field. This is Mile High Stadium when the, when the um, Rockies played there the first two years. And, and it's kind of interesting to see the the growth in Denver since that photo. Next slide. This is a, uh, the, a photo from the groundbreaking in Coors Field on October 16th, 1992. A little bit different. And Mark, some of the people on the call are in that crowd. I believe it. Wave hi to yourself. Let's see, I do one more. There we go. One thing I found interesting about Coors Field is a lot of people know about the Western Metal Supply Building at Petco Park, how they used it, integrated it as the left field flagpole and, and put some um, little party decks on onto it. But this part, part of, uh, believe it or not, Coors Field is over 100 years old. This building that you see there was built in, in 1913 and, and was integrated into Coors Field and is now a brewery. What a great shot. And I think that's it, right? That's our 40? Yeah, yeah I believe so. Now, awesome. Please. Great presentation. And I apologize, we couldn't chat when I'm dreaming, but now we can ask questions. And if anyone has a question, raise your hand. Thank you. And we'll get to you up and down the screen here. See. Let's see, uh, there's some great shots. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the chat. Oh. Okay. So now, if you have a question, please raise your hand. I know, in fact, let me see the, as I'm going forward here. Just catch up. Um, let's see, Patrick Lyons point. Um, here's a good question from Man uh, Manny Hawa has a great point. How many home runs would Mays have hit if he didn't have the problems that he had at Campbell's? So Manny, I just open up your mic. That's a great question. So is, is the mic open hear. or do you want me to answer the question? Okay, I'm looking up and down. Because what I, I don't heard see any is hands up at this time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just ask you, Mark, if you have any other points that you wanted to mention regarding your presentation. Well, no. I, You're open. Well, Go ahead. Uh, Willie Mays and and Candlestick Park or Mark try it again. Okay.
you know, it's that maze in the effect Candlestick Park had on his career home run total. Okay, so let's see if I got this right. What would, how would uh, Willie Mays' home run title been affected if he, if he spent his whole time at Candlestick Park or? Yes. Okay, so you have to remember that Willie May spent the better early part of his career, which was very forgiving to pole hitters uh, because it was only 258 feet down the left field line and further down the right line, 483 feet to center. Uh, that's a tough question to answer. Thanks. Oh. Hey, hey, Mark, thanks for uh, joining us. Now we have a question from Patrick okay, Lyons. Great. I'm going to open it up. Dan, yeah, this is perfect. That was perfect. Patrick, why don't you go ahead and ask that question? Oh. All right, thanks, Dan. Thank you, Mark, for, uh, for joining us for your presentation. It seems like most stadiums have been essentially torn down and, and has been made uh, use for, for another type of building, but has there been any stadiums that have been, you know, reused or repurposed in any fashion? Uh, that you know of, and if so, you know what's been the best use for a former baseball stadium. That's a great question. The most recent example of that is when Turner Field, uh, the Braves moved in the SunTrust, which is now Truist Park, um, a couple of years ago. They they the stadium for Georgia State football. Uh, mm. There, I'm trying to think of offhand if any other examples like that. Um, I mean, there are ballparks that are still around. If you go to League Park, Cleveland, they've actually kept the field dimensions and, and um, kept the ticket office. And there's a playing field there for rec teams. Um, Braves Field in Boston, where the Boston Braves played up until 19, from 1915 to 1922, is now the field. It was a football field, but now it's used for Boston soccer. Um, part of the grandstands are still there, and the, the ticket off field and entrance is still there. So there's been a couple examples, not as many as I would have liked to have seen. If if it was if I could go back in time and and uh, had my say in things that kept the shell to to Abbots Field and repurposed the interior, and they would have kept the entrance to Shy Park and many other things. So a great question. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Manny, I see your, your hand is up. Manny, go ahead. Yeah, can you guys hear me? Yeah, perfect. All right, cool. Hey, Mark, thanks for this, man. And Danny, you've outdone yourself. This is this is fantastic. Um, I think you've changed everything for, for Sabre Rocky Mountain here. This is this is great. But my I just wanted to clarify the, the Willie Mays question. Um, uh, if Candlestick had been enclosed, um, oh, the thought okay. being that maybe the winds, you know, Maybe maybe Willie Mays hits more than 660 home runs. It's a good question, and I could be wrong, but from what I understand, um, the the beautiful thing about what I do on Twitter is is you know all the research I've done and and everything I've learned and share and try to teach people. I learn just as much from my audience as they learn from me, and and. You know, if I make the slightest mistake or if I leave a hole, somebody's always there to fill it in. And, and from what I understand, that you would think that then by, by them filling in or, or enclosing Park, the park, the, the wind issues would have been abated. But for some reason, there, if you look at photos, there was kind of a hill beyond the, on the third side. And because of that, and I'm obviously not a wind expert, but from what I understand, it actually became more windy once it was enclosed. Oh, that's interesting. I've been there, but not before. Yeah, yeah. You know, so, not before they enclosed it. So right, and and what an interesting story about that ballpark was the um, when Horace um, Stoneham, the owner of the Giants, went out to to that candlestick point to plop down where he wanted to have the ballpark. It was a perfect day, and had he been there like a couple of hours later, there would have been a 
massive windstorm and they would have known. Um, also, and I've been doing wind studies um, more recently, had they moved home plate another 100 yards, it would have been night and day as far as wind. Wow, that's great information. I appreciate it. Thank you. No problem. Anytime. Great question. I'm going to call on Chris Quinn now. Chris, go ahead with the Colorado flag in the background. I'm loving it. So I was wondering, what is a stadium aspect? Go ahead, dynamic? Chris. Yeah. I'm sorry, you got to say it again? What is the stadium aspect that has died out that you want to come back and that you believe will come back? That, that is a great question. It takes one person to listen to me. I'm a big fan of your older ballparks like Tiger Stadium, Shad Park, that were, had upper deck that really hung over the field. Um, with Camden Yards, it brought a whole new aspect to, to the architecture in which they, they put the sweet level in the middle, which is a source of income. But what it did is it moved um, the upper deck way further back from where it used to be. And, and it's my belief that if you do the open we had a Tiger Stadium and Community Park and Shy Park, back then in 1912, when all those were built, they required a, a view of structure and support columns. Now, with cancel, modern cantilevering, and uh, I believe you can actually do the same thing without those poles. I would really like to see upper decks come back closer to the field. And and while we're waiting, um, you know, if you if, you know, my ideal ideal. Great question, Chris. Yeah, I'm going to turn now to Chris Moyer. Is Chris Fest? Chris Moyer. Yeah. Hey, Chris. Hey there. Thank you, Mark, uh, for your Go ahead, presentation. Chris Moyer. Yeah, my pleasure. Okay. Thank you for your, uh, thank you for the presentation again. Um, question: uh, You know, if you had a chance, uh, like a fun question, if you had a chance to go back in time to see one of those old photos. Uh, with all those old photos you've had, if you had a chance to go back in time to see one of those old ballparks in person, which one would have been? Great question. I think uh, easily the, the place I would want to go, 1909 Sky Park, the, the revolution of that facility. You know, you're, you're coming from wood, old wooden rackety ballparks. Who basically, what I the first cathedral um, with the you know the French Renaissance architecture and the the, the grand arches and the immaculate masonry and stonework that they did um, definitely shy Park in 99 and way mind-blowingly ahead of anything else up until that time and that's what set off the building that you know where you got Wrigley Field and what where you got Yankee Stadium in 1923 and everything else in between. Great question, Chris. Thank you. Now I'm going to open it up to our chapter president, Paul Parker. Hey, Paul. Hi. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, yeah Mark, a terrific presentation. Really terrific. Um, Thanks for having me. My, my, uh, my question is, um, there are many books on ballparks out there uh, that have been published over time. You go, is one of yours, you know, your Bible or what's your favorite ballpark book? <laughs> that's a great, that's a really good question. And honestly, most of my details have, been, has come from libraries and, and forums and, and there's not really the the ballpark Bible out there. There's a, a website, uh, a fantastic website if you're really into ballparks uh, by Andrew Clem. Just out, just Google Andrew Clem ballparks. Um, it's got all the dimensions and the it shows the evolution of the stadiums and how the grandstands grew and uh, has great details of uh, every little change that made the progress 
time, I actually recommend that more than any book out there. Most of the books I've seen are just kind of picture books with a little bit of detail. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Paul. Thank uh, again, you. thanks for having me. This has been amazing. Well, my, my pleasure, our honor. Our pleasure and honor to have you. Thank you. Thank you. We did get the check mark. Oh man, he. Mark Anderson, I can't thank you enough. An awesome presentation. That was so much fun. And um, candidly, I just, I love all the work you spent going into it to make it a really pleasurable experience for us. Um, why don't you tell everybody how they can follow you on Twitter? Okay, uh, it's at ML Cathedrals. M L B C A T H E. D R A L S. And it's on Twitter, not Instagram, correct? I have a Twitter. I don't have an Instagram or Facebook time. It's just all it's all Twitter. That's what I thought. And say Mark. hi. Say, hey, this is um, so and so. I was at the um, the Saber meeting this afternoon. Say hi. I, I'm I'm really good at responding. You sure are. I'm thankful for that because he gets he gets down for me in the middle of the night when I'm looking at his stuff. Mark, seriously, thank you. Much appreciated. When I approached you a few weeks ago, your enthusiasm for doing this for our chapter was, was really wonderful, and, and I can't thank you enough as a friend. Th thanks, Dan. I'd love to meet all of you in person, and hopefully um, we all get back together soon and, and have the capability of doing that. It looks like Paul Parker is hand up. Parker, Paul, go ahead. Um, I just want to take this opportunity to thank Dan Evans for putting this together. This was uh, terrific. This was a marvelous thing. I also want to thank, um, yeah, everybody. I want to thank Alex Marks for the role he played and uh, everybody else who participated in this. And gosh, what a turnout. It's just terrific. And uh, I'm not sure if Tim Mead is still on, but. Um, uh, he was great too. This really terrific. So thank uh, thank Dan Evans too and Mark. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, everybody. Well, that's it, everybody. Thank you for joining us. At one point, we had 75, no, 76 people on the chat. Um, I'm really appreciative of everybody joining us today. Again, check the website, check the Twitter feed check the, um, uh, the various methods of social communication we have from the Rocky Mountain Sabre chapter, check your emails for updates. If the coronavirus 19 is still going on, still a problem in May, this is probably the way we'll meet again. In the meantime, on behalf of the board, I really wanna wish all of you the very best. The camaraderie is what I miss most in the group. I really love hanging out with everybody every third Wednesday and stealing French fries from Greg Petty and, and Alex Marks. And this is one of those, uh, this is one of those moments that we can just get together and have a little smile on our face. Thanks again to Tim Mead, to Mark Anderson, and for everybody who helped me, especially Jacob Pomerank back in Arizona right now. Jacob, you saved me about an hour ago. So thanks a bunch. Everybody have a good night. We really appreciate you doing this. Thank you very much.